George uh, is not merely one of the funniest writers around, he's one of the very nicest and most genuine writers anywhere around. I don't know of a more original, imaginative mind in Southern writing or American writing, for that matter, than George Singleton. His books uh, do have somewhat offbeat titles, Half Mammals of Dixie, uh, Why Dogs Chase Cars, Drowning in Gruel, um, Gruel, of course, being the name of a town, uh, and his novel, uh, uh, ever so logically titled Novel, and now his brand new book, uh, Work Shirts for Mad Men, which is a uh, delightful tale about uh, a metal sculpturer turned ice sculpturer turned back into a metal sculpturer because ice sculpting didn't go well. George can tell you about how that, how that works. Um, and uh, his, his, his name, the narrator's name is Harp Spillman. As George says, he's feeling lower than a bow-legged fire ant. Um, George has uh, a terrific sense of humor, and he is uh, unquestionably one of the great short story writers. But you know, he also writes a darn good novel, and work shirts for Mad Men is one of them. And I'm really tickled that he decided to come back and give us a second try in Decatur. So please welcome George Singleton by himself. Some of y'all were here during that Roy Blunt thing when I just kind of sat there like an idiot for about 20 minutes, and I thought I was just in a bad dream. I said, I know I saw my name on that program. And <laughs> Lee, where's Lee Fiddler? I saw him in the audience. I said, hey, I think he came, maybe. Man. Uh, so anyway, can y'all hear? Is that okay? Okay, so I'm going to read four little sections of this novel. I'm going to read the first, you know, page three, four, five, six, or whatever, to kind of explain. So that's so I don't have to explain so much in between. Doug, hey man, how you doing? Could, I'm sorry I missed you toward the end of Sunday in Atlanta. Uh, uh, this is a story of a guy named Harp Spillman, and this is the beginning of it. And I have a tendency to just kind of stop in the middle and tell some stories. Sorry, but it'll take a while for that to happen. You'd think that being a saturated and memory lost drunk, I would have been the one who stole the 12 snapping turtles, but it was my wife, Ray Lou, behind the entire operation from original vision to relocation. Here's a good place to stop. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the idiots in the art department at Harcourt just read until they come across an animal because this cover has a snapping turtle on it, and it didn't really have that much to do with the stupid book. One book, they put a jackalope on there, because I don't think I had an animal in that one. And another, they put pink flamingos, because they didn't have one either, and they really thought that these pink flamingos were in South Carolina. I said, they're not, so I had to rewrite a story when, instead of owls going by, they were pink flamingos, maybe lost somehow. And then they put an alligator snapper, which isn't even in South Carolina. They're not, okay, just, ah, idiots. <clears throat> but it was my wife, Ray Lou, behind the entire operation from original vision to relocation. I didn't even know she had an interest in the plight of non-traditional lab animals, never mind the moral bridges certain toxicologists were choosing to cross. Maybe I didn't pay enough attention. Ray Lou shook me awake from the floor of my Quonset hut workspace one dawn and told me she needed a steep-sided, three-foot-deep pool chiseled into our yard by the time she got home that night. She had told me to line it with plastic and the ceramic earthenware tiles she had fired in the electric kiln a week earlier. She said she had enough for about a 240-square-foot area. I, of course, opened my eyes, tried to remember the past 24 hours, and thought about how this was too much math for me to ever remember. Ray Lou said she had written out the phone number of her lawyer friend, Darren, a man who over the past 10 years had bought more than 100 wood kiln fired scary face jugs for my wife. On the to-do list stuck on her refrigerator should she get caught and need bail money. Ray Lou would have her cell phone with her, she said, 
but asked that I not call in case she needed to quietly stake out this female biotoxicologist somewhere between the Lester Maddox and George Wallace boat landings on the Georgia-Alabama border, far from where we lived. I nodded but tried to think if biotoxicologists really existed, and I pretended to know exactly what she was talking about, seeing as I felt sure that she had told me all about this particular ploy sometime within the previous week, month, or year. That's how I operated back then, mostly. I'm not proud, embarrassed, or ashamed. At the time, I figured that drinking helped me to conceive the original ice sculptures that I sold and displayed at weddings, corporate functions, and the occasional bar or bat mitzvah down in Charleston. I don't think that my wife kissed me goodbye there on the cement floor, but she didn't cluck her tongue in a your reputation's been ruined way either. After I heard her drive my refrigerator truck down the driveway, I got up, walked past an unused shovel, and grabbed work gloves, two chisels, and a 12-pound hammer. It seemed right to have a project. Now, our chosen homestead stood atop a mica-flecked and pine-tree-deficient granite hill known as Emberglow, a bulge in upstate South Carolina that, according to past settlers and present-day aviators alike, sparkled even on sliver-mooned nights. Ray Lou and I bought 20 acres of what Hollywood sci-fi movie directors dream about. Our place didn't look dissimilar to St. Exupery's Asteroid B612 is what I'm saying. The previous four or five generations of owners, a family named Coomer, of questionable genes, moral standards, and rational capacities, spent their time believing that they'd find a vein of gold somewhere on Ember Glow. I wish that they had dug three foot deep holes instead of the narrow bores that were 20 feet deep and wide enough only to be a danger for misstepping stargazers, drunks, blind people, and awkward stray dogs. They didn't find gold, of course, and over the years they got buried from what I understood, standing straight up in the graves that they unknowingly dug in their youth. One remaining coomer named Jinx finally decided to give up the family dream and sold us the house and land for the same amount of money his great-grandfather spent, excuse me, missed my place, spent on the place during the reconstruction. Then Jinx Coomer moved to Nevada because, according to him, he could get a civilian job with the government, seeing as he had first-hand knowledge of missile silos and barren landscapes. I chiseled and pried and scraped and tossed chunks of granite, releasing amber bourbon toxins out of pores I had no never noticed before until the sun stood halfway between me and the horizon. Who sweats from his elbows and the tops of his feet? I went inside to get one of Ray Lou's crystalline rock aquifer double oxygenated reverse osmosis bottles of spring water that cost something like five bucks a pint because a special order of monk siphoned and blessed the stuff down in Louisiana. And I saw her refrigerator notes, one for the lawyer, another reminding me that I promised to check myself into outpatient rehab before I fi got fired officially and lost my insurance. I said out loud to no one, oh man, those hot television lights did me in and started remembering everything that I hoped wasn't really true. Like only a worthwhile, desperate, guilty drunk can do, I got in our other car, drove down Ember Glow's hard, shiny road, and didn't stop until I found a pet supply joint 30 miles away that sold the Whisper Internal Filter System 1020 with its large carbon ultra-activated cartridge so Ray Lou's newly rescued snapping turtles wouldn't have to live in their own waste. I bought a dozen and put in an order for more. When I got home, I would have installed the things, too, had I not found one last bottle of old crow stashed behind my ice sculpting tools back in the Quonset hut and then taken a nap on the same spot where I began the day. Okay, that's the first little section. Here's what got him into some trouble. This is a little bit political. It's also fiction. Don't shoot me. Uh, okay, so, you know, the guy used to be a prominent, well-respected, and highly sought-after sculptor who did these commissioned pieces that you see in cities that are large, usually kind of abstract. What is that thing? You know, those kind of sculptures. And then he kind of maybe burned some bridges 
that's a cliche, sorry. And then he had to kind of lower himself to being an ice sculptor and don't, nothing against ice sculpting. I have a friend who's an ice sculptor. I had to ask him these questions. I said, can this possibly be done? He said, probably not, but you're a writer, make it up. <laughs> so the man's name is Mr. DuPont, who has the ice sculpting business, a place called Ice O Thermal. Mr. DuPont, of course, is from the DuPont family in Delaware that's ruining uh, the environment. So he got out of it. I'll try to step on everybody's toes before the night's over, don't worry, including my own. Mr. DuPont had called me in January excited and said that we had a $20,000 project that only I could pull off for some kind of Republican fundraiser down in Columbia in February. They wanted busts of all the famous Southern politicians, past and present, which would be scattered around the ballroom inside the Adams Mark Hotel and Convention Center. Now, I kind of remember listening to Mr. DuPont warn me not to screw up and play any practical jokes. He said, I understand that your political livestock might graze in a different kind of pasture, but if we can get this account every year, I think it would be beneficial to both of us. Hell, you could probably live all year long in Emberglow on what your take will be from this job, man. What's a loaf of bread cost in South Carolina? A dime? Is it true they just hand out cigarettes when you walk into a store down there? Since the entire event, which at this point wasn't but three days old, I kept telling myself it was only a dream, that it wasn't as bad as the news people kept saying. I tried to convince myself that everyone laughed once the bus began to melt, that they didn't turn my way and point fingers, make threats in ways that only Republican donors know how to do, and finally escort me out of the hotel. The last thing I heard, some fellow named Carl yelled out that I could forget about getting paid and that there might be a class action lawsuit coming my way should any of the fainting women decide to press charges for inducing long-term mental suffering and, in, and inciting a riot. I had driven my refrigerator truck home on autopilot, 140 miles on interstate, then two lane, then rocky path, just in time for Ray Lou to point at the television set and say, I told you not to do it. Are you trying to kill yourself? I really want to know, Harp. Are you trying to get me to leave you or something, or do you just want me to shove you in the kiln, cremate your sodden self, and throw your ashes in one of the leftover coomer holes? Sober up sometime and tell me, honey. I looked at the screen. The Carl guy said, Chances of this being coincidence are pretty slim. This has all the markings of an inside job by the Democrats. They're always talking about conspiracies, but I think we have rock solid evidence against them this time. The reporter, a woman I had seen at three in the morning sometimes when I made Ray Lou's coffee, she said, until they melt completely, I guess you'd have to say, the Carl guy stormed off. Here's what I had done, and I can't believe I pulled it off. I carved out some ice sculptures, then set them in square bins. Excuse me. I carved out some ice sculptures, then set them in square bins of water, two at a time in the deep freeze. When the water froze up into blocks of ice, I carved out busts of Strom Thurmond, Jesse Helms, Lester Maddox, Trent Lott, Newt Gingrich, all of the Southern senators and representatives that meant so much to the National Republican Party post-Kennedy when the region I lived in and loved turned radically red. On the afternoon of the fundraiser, I set my ice sculptures up on chunks of granite pillars that stood shoulder high. Carl told me it was supposed to represent the rock-solid commitment of the party. Carl asked me only two things beforehand. Have you been drinking? And will the ice make it through the evening without making a mess on the floor? I said, no, yes, but didn't go into detail how I might not be answering his questions in order. Most of my sculptures could handle room temperature for at least eight hours. I understood the importance of a deep carve in working anything outside of a mold so that the inevitable melting process didn't keep a viewer from still knowing what he or she looked at. And long before the fundraiser, I understood that a room full of Republicans might increase the room's temperature a good 10 degrees. In reality, I thought my little stunt wouldn't happen until the last of the party goers stood around drunk and that they would only blame it on the booze. 
It didn't occur to me that the networks might be there with all of their camera equipment and necessary lights speeding up the process. The $5,000 a person FET began at 6.30, and two hours later, Jesse Helms had melted down to the ice sculpture I had fitted underneath him, namely a grand wizard. <laughs> Strom Thurmond transformed into Mussolini, and Lester Maddox into Tito. I brought along a three-headed bust of Reagan, Bush, Bush, that didn't quite fit the prescribed Southern politician theme, but everyone allowed me to set it right in the middle of the room after I announced that it was my free contribution to the shindig. I brought one of Charlton Heston, too, knowing that all the NRA guys would want to get their photos taken beside it, just like in a wax museum. They weren't so happy when that particular ice sculpture turned into Lucifer. They seemed more upset with what I'd done to Moses than when the three presidents transformed into a perfect rendition of the Three Stooges. Carl and his henchmen escorted me out of the ballroom just as some woman screamed, Newt Gingrich has melted down to Coco the gorilla. On my way out, I tried to explain that it was supposed to be a Neanderthal man, that I would never insult Coco the gorilla. <laughs> Okie dokie. One time, I had to um, do some things, and one of the things I had to do was go to these meetings, and I just couldn't stand them, but they were in South Carolina. Where I don't think they're doing them right. I think you're supposed to say, oh, yeah, I have compassion, try not to drink, all that stuff. And this place that I sometimes went to, they seemed to have a lot of games that they played. And this is made up, but it's not too dissimilar to some of the games. My narrator, Harp Spillman, has gone off to do his rehab stuff, which only lasted two times because the insurance company said, oh, okay, you're healed because that's what insurance companies kind of do nowadays. I actually saw this happen where the rehab guy would say, man, you need about another month. And then he'd come in the next meeting and say, uh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Get out of here. Everything's fine. Like some miracle had happened. Okay, so um, because he's no longer going to these, there's one guy who's in the rehab who says, I've got some friends that will probably help you out. And he brings them. This is kind of a picaresque novel wherein all the rogues and scallywags and weirdos kind of come to Harp Spillman instead of him traveling around having to meet them. And some of these guys are these guys who went so far as to have their elbows fused down in Costa Rica to questionable orthopedic surgeons so they couldn't bring a bottle of booze to their lips. You know, they just, I want to drink, but I can't. And they also couldn't eat or wipe themselves. Um, and, and then this other guy named Bayward who, when Harp first met him, he had on a work shirt that said Bayward and it said nuclear welding. So he said, well, maybe this guy can help me out with these commissioned sculptures that he gets for the city of Birmingham. But as it ends up, everyone, including in these meetings, they wear these work shirts that have this kind of happened to me. You know, you'd say, you'd see somebody go say, hey, my name's Billy and I'm an alcoholic, but he's wearing a shirt that said Eddie or, you know, what? It's a schizophrenia too. I don't get it. Maybe I exaggerate somewhat. Okay, so there's this guy named Billy, and they're at a place that they lovingly refer to as the Alka, Alka Hell Club. <laughs> Billy said, it's good to have such a large crowd here this afternoon for Drunken Jeopardy. For those of you all never done, oh, and this is going to be where I get animated. This is going to be the animated part of the reading, so hold on. <laughs> Billy said, it's good to have such a large crowd here this afternoon for Drunken Jeopardy. For those of you all never done this, here we got it down to a science. I'm going to reach in this here bag. He lifted up a brown paper sack that might have once held a meatloaf sandwich, what with the grease stain seeping through. And I'm going to pull out three numbers. Y'all look under your chairs, and you'll see a number taped on the bottom. First three numbers, well, I think we're all smart enough to know how this works out. I'll be the moderator. Was there ever a question as to whether I'd be chosen right from the beginning? I reached beneath my seat cushion and found a tiny torn sheet of yellow legal pad paper, the number 12 etched on it shakily. I looked over at Bayward, who had 11. I looked around the room and noticed that three or four of the men had already fallen asleep, their heads dangerously close to filled ashtrays, styrofoam coffee cups, day-old glazed donuts. Billy called out my number first, then 22, and then four. I got up and looked, uh, looked around for those fused elbow dudes, but they weren't around yet. I got up in front of the room and had to say, I'm Harp and I'm an alcoholic to avoid getting shot. And after everyone said, hey, Harp, my two opponents introduced themselves as Stu and Clem. 
Clem, I thought. Who has named a boy Clem in the last 200 years? No wonder the man turned to booze. Billy said, we ain't got money for a board to look at or for real buzzers, so I pretty much just pull these questions face down off the lecture here, and the money on back really only means points. Y'all hit your dinger in front of you if you think you know the answer. I'd like to thank Shaky over at his coffee shop for donating the dingers, as always. Okay, y'all set yourselves down here. We slid back three metal folding chairs and sat at an institutional cafeteria table. The dingers were those silver bells that always went off before the words order up emanated from a short order cook's mouth. They were those silver bells heard right before bellhop get this man's grips in old fashioned hotel movies. At the end of all the questions, though, when it's all tallied up, the winner gets the prize, Billy said. As you all know, the 500-point question is harder than the 400 and so on. Clem said, are there any discernible categories? Just like that, maybe even with a slight brogue. I realize that anyone named Clem could only become a drunk or a professor. What I thought was a weird bandana around his neck ended up being a fancy ascot, of all things. A pipe stem poked out of his knockoff Barbara Wool Harris tweed sport coat. Billy said, uh-huh, they all got to do with what got us here. Louder and to the audience, Billy said, I don't know how many of y'all remember old TCB. His first name was TC and his last name, what with us being anonymous and all, began with the letter B. Anyway, TCB invented this game all by himself. We've been playing for more than 10 years, I'd say, about once a month. Anyway, TCB, uh, we blah, blah, blah. TCB wrote up enough questions and answers for us to play into eternity, or at least into the next generation here. Okay, any more questions? Are y'all ready? Clem, stew, harp? I started laughing because it sounded like clam stew. I nodded my head. Billy said, for 100 points, who's the most famous man to ever come out of Lynchburg, Tennessee? I went, ding, I said, Jack Daniel. Who is Jack Daniel? That was my animated part. <laughs> Billy nodded. He said, I forgot to introduce our scorekeeper. Hey, who wants to volunteer to be a scorekeeper? It's got to be somebody who knows how to add and won't cheat for his favorite. No one volunteered. Billy said, it might slow down the game some, but I'll do it. He looked around for a pencil until Clem pointed toward Billy's ear. Okay, 100 points for you, he said. For 200, who's the most famous man to come out of Claremont, Kentucky? I hit the dinger. I said, who is Jim Beam? <laughs> Correct, Billy said. To my competitors, he said, it's obvious this here harp knows a thing or two about bourbon. Don't y'all worry. We'll get to your favorites before long. He wrote down my score. For 300 points, fill in the blank. I believe I might have poisoned myself last night because juniper berries is poison, and that's what blank is made of. I had never been much of a gin drinker at the age of 16, though one time my mother and I got tanked on the first spring-like day during an Irish traveler parade that took place out on the road to Murphy Village. This is where the guys brought up down down near, you know, other side of Augusta. That's what my mom said, too. Let's get tanked on some Tanqueray. We sat on our porch, armed with gin and tonics that waved and waved at men we knew were about to crisscross the nation, conning people out of their silverware somehow. To Billy, I said, what is gin? I'll be damned, he said. He looked at Clem and Stu. Y'all can jump in whenever you like. <laughs> I could smell beer on Stu's breath. He leaned over and held onto the table in front of us, his hands on both sides of his bell. Someone in the back of the room yelled out, go to the moonshine questions, give Stu a chance. <laughs> Billy did not acknowledge Stu's fan club. He said, I'm gonna go back to one of the 100 point questions. Here we go. He picked up a file card from the lectern. Budweiser likes to brag about its finest hops and what? It was only a hundred point question. I held on for a moment in order to allow one of my drunk brethren to answer. They didn't. Clem said, I was always a Guinness man myself. And Martini's, ding, I said, what is barley? 
this went on forever. I'm talking, I amassed something like 7,500 points at the end of round one. I got the first nine answers in round two also, which must have had a wild animal theme. Old crow, wild turkey, black dog, gray goose, black eagle, cougar, rare eagle, fighting cock, and beef eater. But then Stu threw up on the table, and Clem White walked right out of the meeting, mumbling something about how he must not really be an alcoholic if he didn't know any of these answers. I pictured him driving straight into downtown Greenville and bellying up to one of those microbrewery places, then pontificating about pubs he had frequented in Ireland, Zimbabwe, and the Canary Islands. Billy said, okay, I guess our winner today is Harp. Harp, I don't know your last letter. What's your last letter? I said, Spillman. He said, today's winner is Harp S. He reached into the paper bag and said, okay, it's time for three new contestants. Can somebody go get some paper towels and clean off the table? At the Christmas Alcathon, we'll have a tournament of champions, you know, where there'll be a really big money prize. I said, okay and started back to the table. I wanted out of there. Let me say that I wasn't proud to know all of the answers. It made me think. It made me wonder what I'd missed out in regards to what I should have known over the last 10 or 20 years of hard drinking, stuff like what went on in the art world <clears throat> or how to make a woman know that you love her. I said to Bayward, I can't hang out for the next one. If you want, I'll come back and I'll come and pick you up. I'll come back and pick you up. He said, I know you was smart, but I didn't know what a big alcoholic you really was. I'm beginning to agree with you, too. This might not be the best place for you to hang out talking only about booze 24-7. Billy yelled for me to stop as I reached the door. He said, don't forget your prize, and he handed me a small box. I thanked him and inched out the door, embarrassed that I got caught leaving early. He said, come on back and often. Of course, I expected a Bible or one of about a million paperback books concerning sobriety. When we got to the truck, Bayward lit a cigarette and offered me one. I shook my head and opened up my prize to find a Swiss Army knife, used but in good condition. I said, oh, man, this is nice. It would take another eight months before I learned that the bottle and can opener attachment had been broken off intentionally like a possessed demonic digit. One last little section. Everybody okay? We all right? Okay. Okay. So he, he and Ray Lou, Harp and Ray Lou, live on this kind of sloped granite piece of land, which is, uh, that is called a quaquaversal piece of land. That's a big word because I ain't got nothing else to do in Dacusville but look up some big words and then I'm not going to use them because if I go down to the general store and say, yeah, that uh, quaquaversal Little Debbie's oatmeal pie looks pretty good, I'll get the crap beat out of me. <laughs> so they live on this piece of land and they've lived there for more than 10 or 15 years and there's a man who lives down kind of at the end of there's not really a driveway, it's just he drives wherever he wants on this piece of granite and there's a man named Mr. Poole, and he's talked to Mr. Poole just a few times, and Mr. Poole's got a lot of things in his yard, and Mr. Poole has often, said, or on occasion, said something about his better half being inside, but he's never seen a wife or anything. Mr. Poole also likes to, like most of the people where I live, run kind of scams. At one point, he had gone around, down around Greenville area and Pickens and Easley and Dacusville, and he told people, I know how to get rid of fire ants. You need to cover your fire ant mounds with silver dollars and that'll kill them somehow. So people did and then he'd go back at night and pick up everybody's silver dollars and turn them in, you know, because um, silver is approaching $13.50 an ounce or whatever it is. Now he's got this idea where, excuse me, <clears throat> he's somehow smuggled some anteaters. He says he's going to smuggle some anteaters there and put them on leashes and train them to kill these fire ants. So he's told Harp about this earlier, and Harp said, yeah, okay, whatever you say. All right, this is the last little section I'll read. I heard a commotion all the way down the quaquaversal slope of our existence and cut off my welder. What sounds did anteaters make, I thought to myself. 
Ray Lou returned telephone messages she had gotten over the previous three or six days to customers who wanted specialized face jugs with crooked eyeballs, swollen cheeks, freakish freckles, a chin that could open a beer bottle. These weren't the sounds of any mammal I'd ever encountered, grunts so low that I thought an 18-wheeler low-geared it up the drive, and pitches so high that every dog in a 10-mile range probably cocked its head. I set my MIG, my MIG welder down and wandered to Poole's house where, sure enough, four anteaters occupied four cages. These weren't the pygmy variety anteaters either. Not that I had had the time to research my neighbor's new pets, but it seemed that his bootlegger somehow smuggled in the largest anteaters this side of the Mesozoic era. They looked like freakishly long German shepherds hobbling around in search of an exit. Poole stood there shirtless, looking at his business venture. I said, good God, man, what was that noise? He said, I told you. I told you about them things. I could tell on your face you didn't believe me. I told you. Man, I said, I'll give you this one, Poole. I don't know how you pulled it off. Then that noise occurred again from inside his house. Poole said, you better go home now. Come on back tomorrow. My first thought that was that he watched some kind of horror movie and that he'd connected a good 10 or 12 speakers to his television set. I said, what the hell's that noise? The anteaters didn't seem affected. Maybe they had great senses of smell but not much hearing. Like I said, I had done no research. Poole turned around and yelled, I'll be in in a minute. Hold on. He turned back to me. It ain't what you think. Again, I had lived up the hill from Poole more than a decade. I'd never seen a wife. I remembered his mentioning a better half once, but that turned out a lie. And I had never seen a child out in the yard. I'd seen prospective customers come by to ask about lawnmowers, washing machines, radio flyer sleds, buckets of Leland cypresses, piles of bark mulch, rebuilt Schwinn's, 55-gallon drum ham smokers, rustic gas station signs, rusted gliders, rusted links of rebar that might have been mine originally, but I never took inventory, cardboard boxes of rust-oleum, and the occasional wreck sedan. I said, don't think I don't live all the way out here nowhere without a pistol and a cell phone, which might have been true, though Ray Lou was in charge of the phone ever since I didn't fully understand roaming charges. And the 38 I got once to shoot up car hoods for a sculpture ended up far off my property somewhere when I evidently mistook it for a boomerang. The sound emitted again, and Poole called back, I'm picking the oranges, girl. They ain't, in, they ain't there inside the pantry. I looked at the anteaters. One stuck its snout outside the bars of the cage and shifted its weight from side to side. Sounds to me like you have some cages inside, Poole. I think you have a woman held against her will inside. Well, come on then, Poole said. She ain't going to like a stranger in the house, but if you got to know. Then, turning toward his front door, he said, maybe it'll help you out with your heart, though I'm pretty sure he meant art. Poole's shingle-sided house, which must have come in third place to the Winchester house, then mine, in terms of built-on additions, held heart pine hardwood floors throughout, and they were noticeable because no furniture stood in the first two dens we entered. The walls held scars not caused by cracking plaster, for none of the fissures appeared from the ceiling to about chest level. We walked into the kitchen, a room with a wood stove, a formica top table, two chairs, and an apparatus that seemed half playpen, half high chair. I said, you have a nice place, because I remembered that people uttered such things. When was this place built? The 20s? I thought, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? She'll want a special orange, Poole said. He lifted the wooden lid of a vegetable bin and handed me two round new potatoes. He reached in the sink and got a paring knife for me. Just peel off the skin and make it round as possible, he said. The wailing occurred again from maybe three rooms away, down a hall. I said, is that your wife? It's my little sister. I ain't ever married, though I told you that once. You'll understand soon. I wanted to drink something bad. I peeled but searched the glass-doored cupboards, 
glass doored cupboards for a likely booze cache. Poole dropped his potatoes, not much larger than ping pong balls, on the table and pulled a jar of tang off of the ancient refrigerator, a neck high coolerator brand. Needless to say, the tang looked older than his kitchen appliances. The house smelled faintly of natural gas, baby powder, and bacon grease. Poole shook tang granules out on the potatoes. I said, What are we doing? Are these for the anteaters? He said, Arthet. He handed me the jar and nodded once for me to follow his lead. I said, Arthet, that's a cool name, and walked behind him to where, finally, only a whimper emanated. Now, it's no secret that DNA disasters run rampant in parts of the South. If it's not relatives coupling, it's tainted groundwater, lead in the moonshine, syphilis, adult chicken pox, uncured ham, toxin bloated fish, and or plain bad luck. If it's not pure cause and effect, it's an administered hex. Poole led me into a small room where his baby sister, who somehow had survived to the age of 30, lay on a makeshift hospital bed, her body all limbs and gigantic head, her mouth agape, revealed. I'll be the first to admit that I considered post-acute withdrawal syndrome here, that maybe I hallucinated this part. Two long incisors rooted in the roof of her mouth. She wore pajama bottoms, but a light blue work shirt with Carolina waist stitched over one pocket and Peyton over the other. Here you go, Arthette, Poole said. He handed over one tang-covered potato, which she grasped like any other wild animal might. To me, he said, it's cheaper to buy her dollar shirts from the flea market and throw them away than to wash them. I've had a bunch, mostly from this joint Carolina waste. Yesterday she went by Jason, I believe. Day before that, JC, one word. Day before that, JC, like initials. I got no idea what Carolina waste does, but they got themselves a mess of employees. Arthette chewed three or four times, then let out the noise and stuck her, and stuck her left arm my way. I said, Hey, Arthet, as if I spoke to a newborn or a questionable stray. Give her a orange, Harp Spillman. She don't bite. She can stick her mouth onto you like a leech, but she don't bite. He said, not that I'd have it any other way, but you can see how come I'm always trying to make a dollar. Keeping Arthet costs some money. The anteaters might make us enough for real medicine. Ain't that right, Arthet? I did not mean to say, there's no god or human who could cure this plague aloud. Thanks. Stop. Okay, now we do Steve and Patty. Uh, I walked with them for like an hour because my volunteer didn't show up to walk me from Agnes Scott here to the Roy Blunt room. That's another story. It was a lovely time. The Holiday Inn charged my credit card for the whole ordeal, even though it's supposed to be paid. But Bill got me this. the key ring to the city. <laughs> if y'all have ever gotten the key to the city, we'd take a little drive somewhere. <laughs> also this. Courthouse. Pretty cool. That's cool. Hey, look, someone take a picture. Think, Bill, am I going to do some questions? Please. Who has a question? <laughs> yes, sir. Do you like no, uh, you know, here's what happened with that. Uh, sorry, my answers are going to ramble. Um, you know, I, when I first started writing, I wrote in third person a big, fat, bad 450 page novel. Then I wrote another little 250 page novel in third person, a 300 page novel in third person. Then I had this granola eating girlfriend who said, you're scared to write in first person because you're scared to share your emotions. 
And I thought, anger, hatred, envy, those are emotions. I'll write about you, woman. So then I started writing in first person. And, of course, I had writing teachers that said, you idiot. It's a lot easier to write in first person. So then now I'd written a 1,000 pages you know, of fiction, which is kind of just, just always – people always said that would happen, and that did. Then I started writing first person short stories and, and just kind of found my voice. But it, now it had been like seven or eight years had gone by of, of writing. So then I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, wrote, wrote in first person. And every, now I'm writing a bunch of third person stories. Uh, the last five short stories I've written have all been in third person. I don't like to write them. I like to read other people's third person stories. I think they're great. But when I'm writing them myself, they sound like essays. They just sound dull to me. My, my own writing and that kind of – but then again, my first-person stories, I get kind of sick of them too. <laughs> <sighs> so, you know, um, let me see. Um, Drowning in Gruel, the last book, the previous book, half of the story – or I think there are 17 or nine – there may be 17 stories, and I think nine are in first person, eight are in third person. Next question. Steve, you got a question? Hurry up. Come on. Indianapolis, all right. A lot of those weird Sears homes. I'll save it. I'll save it. So did, did this start out as a novel or a short story? Novel. You know, I'd kind of um, – here's what happened. I was on a big old drinking binge for, oh, 40, 30-some-odd years, let's just pretend, for a long time. One of those people, you know, you know, just you know, you think you're supposed to drink if you're a Southern writer, and that kind of got out of control. And it got out of control. Oh, about the time I got thrown into jail in Oxford, Mississippi, and got asked to leave an airport in Richmond, and also I had this box of fiction where the main character kept changing names about every two or three paragraphs, and I said, I better stop. And so then I used that time to just kind of write <clears throat> this. I also wrote it because. You know, I'd written all those short stories, and I had one book critic say, George Singleton's a liar. He said he'd never read, write a novel. Because in some interview, I said, no, I'll never write a novel. But I was drunk when I said it. So I'd never write a novel. He's a big liar. He's written a novel. What's he doing? Blah, 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 blah. So I wrote a second novel because now I can still say I've never written a novel. I've written two and A and 2 are two different mathematical concepts. Ha, I win. Uh, and I just kind of knew that this was going to be. And some of it's kind of, I met a guy who's similar to Bayward. Um, a lot of men named Tim. I don't know what the cause and effect was with that, but a lot of men named Tim. T-I-M. Sorry. Uh, so that that was it, and then and then I've been, and then since then I've written a little 200-page novel because I was just trying to write a little short one, kind of like Ray by Barry Hanna. I was trying to write a real short little thing, just for fun of it, because I ain't got nothing else to do, and you got to make up my own little exercises. And and this is about a, that thing, which I will continue to write forever and ever, is about a a 17-year-old narrator who doesn't know his biological father, and it's between his junior and senior year, and high school when this kind of elderly man shows up and says, I'm taking you on a college tour, I'm your father. And this is a very famous social commentator, art critic kind of guy. And But they never really make it but to the Grove Park Inn. They only make it 60 miles down the road. And my narrator says, I don't even want to go to college. I want to be a stand-up comedian. So this is a gimmick, by the way. My narrator, whose name is Stanley, but, he's, but his father's name is Stanley Dabbs, but Stan, the narrator, goes by Stain because he's from South Carolina where people say Karen and Mary and Stanley, like that. It's my home state. I love it, but it's something. Um, they've never given me the key chain to the city. Um, um, so, so he is now able to just write jokes, and if they're funny... Well, what do you expect? He's only 17 years old. Give me a break. And, you know, if they're not funny, and if they are funny, you know, what the heck. So th there's that. And then I'm writing all these stories. This will be a book that's like 900 pages, so no publisher will ever publish it because they're all about this guy getting a low residency master's degree in Southern Culture Studies from a satellite campus of Ole Miss in a town called Taylor, Mississippi. So he goes to this place called Ole Miss Taylor. Makes you think of Aunt B, doesn't it? All right. What was the question? No. 
Doug, thanks. I was supposed to play that joke. So Doug, I saw Sunday, and he goes, man, there's this guy named Man, and I had to read with him, and he memorized three pages, and then we had to follow him. So we uh, took Man outside and beat him up and said, don't do that anymore because it makes the rest of us look real bad. All right? Yes, sir. I don't know, but I'm real fascinated. I, I don't know if I have or not. You know, I thought this may be politically incorrect. You know, around where I'm from, they call them gypsies. I think that's politically incorrect. You can go right up Irish Travelers, and they have a website from Murphy Village, you know, and sometimes you know, it's been kind of on 60 Minutes. If you go through that little town around Murphy Village where you see these big pink brick seven, 8,000-square-foot houses and usually a little trailer out back and a big statue of the Virgin Mary in the front, that's an uh, interesting is there, are there any Irish travelers here? <laughs> I've only really met one. He sealed my driveway. <laughs> he spray painted it black. I came home. That's not sealed. Where, where'd you go, man? You're gone. That was fun. It's not that hard to seal a driveway, you learn. You just need a big mop and that, you know, and you just do it. You kind of paint the rear end. Okay. Next question, anybody? Thank you. Hey. No, I've, I, um, one time I, um, I think, but this is back in the day, I think I camped out on it one, is there like a campground up there and you can go and, yeah. I camped out on it one time I went to some Braids games, I remember there's a doubleheader one, and this was back in, I tell you exactly, it was 1987, I met these people from Greensboro, we were all poor and, and had a good time. I can't climb up that thing. Do you need a rope or something? I don't even know the right words. Piton or something? Rope? Oh, I mean, well, we'll see. Maybe. A good maybe. This is a trick. Y'all are going to be standing behind a tree. Y'all are with the Republican National Committee, aren't you? You're going to shoot me. Uh, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Okay. Uh, the more you talk about it, the less I'm going up there. I'll tell you that right now. I know these tricks. Don, is that you? Man, Jack Pendarvis I've been reading, and he's funny. And Doug right here is really funny. There's some funny, I think, funny writers. And, you know, George Saunders, I think, is funny. Uh, and then the old time. I laugh at Flannery O'Connor uh, still. Um, the Bible. Nah, I was just kidding. I was just kidding about that part. I was just kidding. <laughs> just lightning. That was funny. I was kidding. That was just a joke. But wouldn't you think they'd give Lazarus a, more, a better speaking part? I mean, you know, come on. Say something. Okay, next one before I just get fried. I'm going to get fried. Is that about it? What? No. Not on tape. No. I know that trick, too. No. Yes, sir. I'll tell you two stories. Um, okay, so um, the, my publicist, is a nice guy, says, got a good review from Kirkus Reviews on this book. And these are anonymous reviews. So there can be some just people who hate you and say, hey, I'll do that book, you know. Well, it was a, it was, he, I got hammered. It was a terrible, it was the meanest review. And it wasn't even, I said, that's not even in the book. That's like in the acknowledgement page. That's not part of it. You know, I like well, I said, thanks for bringing me this. It's not like these characters go around drinking yoo on every page. Like, it's blah, blah, blah. So, then I got asked to write, then Esquire magazine sent me a napkin in the mail, a cocktail napkin. Said, will you write a short story on this napkin? We got this old project that we're doing. I said, yeah, all right, what the hell? Okay, so I just gotten hammered by this Kirkus review. So I wrote this story, and it's about a guy sitting in a bar 
writing down a list of things to do to be greener. He's worried about deforestation. And the first thing he writes is, you know, maybe no cocktail napkins would help us have more trees. <laughs> and then this woman comes in out of nowhere, and she's carrying this big canvas duffel bag, and her hair's all matted and not like in a cool Athens, Georgia kind of way. And she stinks. You can smell her from three doors down, and she's got dirt under her fingernails, and She's just nasty, and she's kind of mean. She starts, who's getting, somebody give me a beer, and like that. And he sees a duffel bag, and he's been thinking about cleaning up the environment, and my narrator says, hello, have you been picking up aluminum cans on the side of the road? And she says, no, you stupid SOB, and she opens up the canvas bag and starts pulling out all these paperback books that are called advanced reader's copies, and she says, I am a book critic for Kirkus Reviews, if you'd like to know. So that's how I get back. And it's, if you look at that Esquire, like, I don't know if it's going to be in the magazine. I don't know what they're doing. I'm not quite sure what anybody's doing. But, but if you look on, like, Esquire.com, it's right there. Shows the handwritten little thing, and then it's typed up. So that was one thing. And maybe others. Hey, Doug. Shucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I first got out of um, graduate school, I got a job offer here in Atlanta working at a school that I don't remember what it was, but it was, seemed like an odd school, but I had no options. And it was living in a, it was a fancy schmancy, really high price school where each, I would have like one student per class. And I think they may have had some emotional problems or something. And I had to live there. So I, and then I got another job offer. I said, I'll take that one. But when I was going to come here, I thought, I'm going to do, try to do stand up. Because sometimes, like I'll, especially like in the summer, I'll just go, man, these jokes are just coming. And they're like Stephen Wright jokes, you know, like, like jokes like, uh, um, my wife says she never sees fireworks when we make love, so I took two ceiling fans and put them right above the headboard, and in the middle of everything, I turn them on, and she still doesn't see fireworks, but sometimes she says, it feels like an airplane just crashed through the wall. You know, they're those kind of dumb jokes. But I have such bad stage fright, I, I get so scared, there's no way I could do that. And if I had a heckler, I would flip out, you know. So the answer is no, kind of. That's two no's in really long answers. Okay, that about it? Bill? I, I ain't going to answer these old, these lead. Okay, why don't you ask me something about politics, and I'll say it, and then I'll get thrown in jail here. <laughs> now, go ahead. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> there are many fine candidates on both sides <laughs> running. Many, many. Many fine candidates, full of candidates, <laughs> actor candidates, ex-mayor candidates, Forrest Gump candidates. <laughs> now, did you have a serious question? <laughs> no. You're just trying to take up an hour. You're trying to make me just talk here like an idiot for an hour. Okay. All right, then that's about it, right? Oh, that's what I need to say. Well, that's something I can say. Many of you may buy books. Uh, sometimes I go to do book signings, you know, let's say at Malaprops in Asheville, and there'll be like 100 people at these book signings, and then I'll sign two books. And, and that's fine. They're getting free entertainment. They'll pay $30 to go see David Sedaris, but then no. <laughs> so, so maybe they're buying their books from Amazon, but, and that's fine. I'll, I've bought books on uh, many occasions from Amazon, but Amazon doesn't, pay taxes that help your streets. It's the, it's the bookstores. Even, even, you know, Barnes & Noble has to pay some taxes that's going to go into the community somewhat. So that's why I try to push, um, you know, there's always those independent. But if they do something wrong to you, then don't do it because this is America and we can spit on people. But for the most part, they're nice people. Beck out there seems to be real nice. She didn't throw anything at me and all that. All right, you all right? Yeah, okay? All right, thank you a lot.